Okay, so um, today's lecture is going to um, really be, in a way, a, a capstone um, lecture for the, the course as a whole, in that it weaves together uh, discussions of uh, the three major methods uh, that we've visited in turn. Uh, system dynamics uh, modeling with a particular focus on aggregate applications of system dynamics. Secondly, agent-based modeling. And thirdly, discrete event simulation. Uh, but it weaves them together, uh, not only in a narrative, but also in terms of particular models considered. Uh, specifically, we, we are going to see how we can, within a single package, any logic, and true to that name, we can take models in any of these traditions um, take the, the logic captured within the, the, the methodology specific uh, characterizations, formalisms associated with each of those modeling types and place them within single models, um, models that uh, secure advantages through having different areas of the model adumbrated, captured by different of these methods. And we'll see that these methods, in fact, uh, far from being the sort of solitudes as they're often, often um, characterized as uh, within uh, literature or within discussions from practitioners of one method alone, um, we'll see how they can be woven together. And in fact, they can be woven together very naturally. Um, not only that, but there's a set of patterns uh, by which we link up these modeling types where true to the vision of, of systems thinking and complex systems analysis, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, we get a synergy between these approaches, uh, which, is, which goes beyond complementarity and where uh, each of the approaches can really uh, uh, use the others to best effect. Um, as we'll see, uh, this weaving together of multiple approaches also uh, addresses core needs in the human theater of modeling by allowing greater resonance by stakeholders um, uh, as to model structure, better understanding of what a model really means um, by, by parceling out the right type of method for the right section of the model. Um, more deeply than that, um, I want to harken back to our, our notion of, of models as learning prostheses, um, a, a stance that I articulated within the opening day of class. Uh, within this concept, far from being crystal balls, models are tools to help us learn more quickly, more deeply, more effectively. Um, about, about aspects of the external world. They help sharpen our thinking. It's not so much that the model is right, but the model helps us more quickly identify when our thinking is wrong. Uh, models help us fail early, fail often with a quicker turnaround time so that we can more quickly advance our understanding and as we say, fail forward fail in a way that, um, that sets us up for future success. This is the role that models play and hybrid modeling um, can facilitate that by allowing us far from having to put all our eggs in one basket and, and adhere to just one tradition when building our models uh, and, and just hope that that tradition will take us all through the modeling project as as we learn more and more about our needs, that that, that one tradition will, will provide us the requisite support to, to address those needs. We can, within a hybrid modeling framework, change what areas of our model, what spheres of our model uh, we, we characterize using one modeling set of formalisms, one modeling methodology, system dynamics, agent-based modeling, or discrete event simulation. And we can change that boundary over time. So if we find through our learning, for example, through sensitivity analysis, that the model is extremely sensitive to heterogeneity within 
the population, we can make use of a method such as agent-based modeling that can readily allow us to capture heterogeneity. Um, if we discover that uh, aspects of geographic context play an outside role in discussions with stakeholders and interpreting model results, we can adopt that a, a geographic perspective in agent-based modeling for that section of a model. We can start simple, perhaps with an aggregate system dynamics model for a lot of it, um, but as networks um, play a, a larger and larger role in our understanding of, of how effects between agents are mediated or between organizations, um, effects that we discover concerning the nested environments in which, um, uh, in which members of the population circulate and, and how those multi-scale effects uh, affect them, we can, we can adopt um, those components of modeling methodologies, such as an agent-based modeling, to, to better structure that part of the model to be true to our need to learn more more deeply about those key aspects of the problem. In short, we can shift our focus. And if sensitivity analyses but with more sophisticated, articulated areas of our model reveal that there's a little return for the extra detail, we can roll back to a more aggregate perspective, uh, roll it up into system dynamics. And more deeply, as we'll see, um, we can even have different parts of a say a given individual's life course um, captured with different methods. Perhaps through much of their life, they're, they're captured as a number in a stock with an aggregate system dynamics no, no, model. But uh, upon developing certain needs or certain risks, upon developing certain exposures, say exposure to, to COVID-19 in an in a infecting way, they are lent a face upon the world and become an agent, a full-blown agent with um, the requisite features, detail, context, and ability to track them at an individual level through the remainder of their life course. And it's fitting that I speak for you um, uh, in the later stages of the most acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic, where our hybrid models, hybrid all of them, have for months and months helped shape thinking and in many, many cases, uh, decision-making from the ground level to the level of, of topmost uh, members of, of the ministry. In, in shaping our province's response to COVID-19. Um, so you will see next week a, a, a glimpse of those models. Indeed, we have a guest lecture on Tuesday, um, uh, who's, um, which will concentrate on our, our, our hybrid uh, ABM, discrete event simulation uh, model which has also at times used constructs related to system dynamics. Uh, we'll probably see at some point a, a rich way in which we individuated agents at a certain stage, namely infection for COVID-19, um, turning them from numbers in a stock and flow model into, into individual agents. Um, and next week, we'll also be learning about a different sort of hybrid <clears throat> associated with combinations of machine learning methods with system dynamics models in the form of our particle filtering model, um, which uh, every day through the uh, assistance of some of those on this very call, um, we provide guidance uh, not only to our province and hundreds within the province to whom the, uh, the results are circulated, uh, but to the Public Health Agency of Canada for every province in the country and to First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of Health Canada for the First Nations reserves across Canada. These are production level models. These are industrial strength models. And they are articulated according to the principles of hybrid modeling that we will be visiting today. 
So I'd like you to, to lend attention. And I'm going to be, be explicating this um, with a series of vignettes that draw on those models shared with you not 10 minutes ago uh, on the Moodle site. So be, if you haven't retrieved them yet, please do so um, because we'll be, um, we'll be tapping into them forthwith, okay? So uh, I'm going to go and share my screen here so that we can, uh, we can open up some of those models in a joint way. And uh, I'm going to be weaving together um, uh, true, uh, true to the to the woven uh, character of this lecture. Indeed, I'm going to be weaving together um, uh, components of uh, the hands-on exercises on the one hand, with the um, with the uh, coverage of uh, of the uh, slides. Okay, so um, this lecture is organized around a set of compelling patterns. For, for hybrid modeling. Um, these are patterns which we've drawn on dozens of modeling projects over the years, but are little known. Um, they're little recognized, like software patterns. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Gang of Four book um, by Johnson and others, um, which um, was a seminal text in describing software patterns. Um, as in the software patterns area, these modeling patterns are often formal. They're, 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 they're built up um, by dint of circumstance as useful, um, uh, recognized as useful, deployed in, in, in many different particular instances, but without the dignity being attached to them of being formalized and described for many years. Um, and this lecture weaves together five of the most uh, salient of those patterns and, and the most powerful. Um, it's an unfortunate sociological commentary on the, the state of system science, uh, of, of complexity science, this science of the whole, that it's a fragmented discipline. Often it, and all too often over re recent decades, it's fallen into camps the system dynamics camp, the agent-based modeling camp, and the discrete event simulation camp. And like ships in the night, often these camps pass each other with uh, nary a notice of each other's contributions and with, uh, with a, a lack of, of appreciation often for the potential of the other approaches. And from this seat, I've argued before, uh, to you, uh, not uh, one one month thence. That that in in many respects, this re reflects the fact that practitioners of one discipline, when they interpret or one methodology, when they interpret another methodology or another tradition, they they view it through the lens, the sclerotic and sort of narrow lens of the purposes for which models are built in their own, their own methodology. Why people pursue discrete event simulation um, uh, is, is how discrete event simulation modelers often interpret agent-based modeling or interpret system dynamics modeling. Uh, system dynamics modeling has a long tradition of, of prizing certain types of contributions and uh, all too often uh, judges agent-based modeling through that lens and um, judges it uh, less than fully worthy. And this is the risk. Um, and uh, as one of the few courses worldwide which exposes students to all three of these major methods, you, dear viewers, are especially equipped to take a broader perspective and recognize that each of these approaches um, comes with not just a, a different set of formalisms, a different set of building blocks, a different set of ways of capturing the semantics of dynamical systems, these systems where the, the change at any one time depends on the state of the system. But, but um, further to recognize that um, it's often the different motivations for building 
uh, models in each tradition that, um, that most distinguish them. It's the emphasis on changing mental models and system dynamics. It's the emphasis on agent agent interaction and, and capturing uh, an understanding of the interaction of environment and agent that plays such a central role within agent based modeling in driving emergent patterns, these nested contexts. And in a discrete event simulation, our interest often lies in, in elucidating the impact of different levels of resourcing or different types of resourcing, placement of resources on things such as throughput, the number of individuals we could serve per unit time within a uh, facility or a process or, or which, uh, which governs the, uh, the speed with which a given individual proceeds through or the variability or the, the uh, how long they're kept waiting at certain stages or the, the length of the queue at different stages. Um, these are models, modeling traditions as differing as much in the questions that they ask as the answers that they give. Um, and you're particularly equipped um, to, to consider that. And I'd ask you um, to reflect on the fact for this lecture that within a given modeling project, often we have several motivating questions and different layers of questions, different questions that emerge later in the process as learning takes place. Um, and indeed, this, this provides one of the big reasons for weaving together these methods. So I've argued that system science methodology is far from being uh, solitudes, they are highly complementary, and uh, no one system science methodology, no matter what you hear, offers a replacement for others. Those who articulate that are all too often those who have not seriously engaged with the other methodologies. I've seen it time and time again in each of those camps. It's the people who, who haven't really secured the authenticity of, of uh, direct experience haven't had their time in the crucible of applying different methods that judge those other methods unfavorably because they don't truly understand how to use them to best effect. And significant synergies here, I would argue as a multi-method practitioner can be secured by using a combination of methods. Um, we can use these combinations for multiple points of gain. One is, to secure comparative advantage of one technique versus another. Sometimes we have a certain area at the model where network effects are foremost, effects of, of networks uh, between individuated actors. And agent-based modeling shines within that context. Uh, in, different, in other cases, we may have questions um, that prioritize changing mental models in a simple aggregate um, system dynamics characterization really speaks to changing mental models. I've seen it within the halls of our very institution where high level uh, government practitioners have had their mental model of core processes into which hundreds of millions of dollars have been, have been uh, placed suddenly changed by a simple two stock model. Um, these things cut through uh, confusion often by virtue of their simplicity. So often, you know, we have different needs in different areas uh, with respect to analysis or communication with stakeholders. Uh, we can, in, in some cases, make use of a method which, which will just cut through that, that uh, confusion or communicate with greater clarity. Physicians, for example, um, uh, those who are practicing doctors um, often have a very individual-based um, understanding of a model. And we can use a representation, be it discrete event simulation or agent-based modeling, that speaks to that stakeholder. Demographers, those who deal with, with patterns of, of the population, often have a very stock and flow type characterization. And we can use that, that appropriate approach to speak to them most effectively. But one of the most important uh, advantages here is the capacity to evolve the boundary between approaches as, as learning takes place. And I spoke to that earlier, I won't belabor the point here, except to note that by weaving these together into a single model, rather than building 
separate models that are built with each tradition in turn, we can best exploit this, um, this sort of flexibility. Um, as it turns out, we can also secure great computational efficiency. Uh, one of our models here in the province used foundationally for capacity planning last summer was a model where most of the population, the vast majority was represented as stocks and flows. But when individuals reached a point in their continuum, one could make an infection, one could make it exposure. Um, they were, they became agents. That affords us an extreme economy. That sort of model could be used for the entire Canadian population. And in fact, quite possibly for the entire US population. Um, so uh, here, by using the right method for the right segment of the population, often we can, um, secure great frugality when it comes to our, our use of computational resources and use those resources to greatest effect rather than just assuming that all the model has to be captured with one framework. One framework, ladies and gentlemen, to rule them all. Um, and uh, finally, we can engage uh, with different characterizations at different scales to which are articulated in different frameworks. So these are the compelling five patterns, the five patterns that we'll be seeing today. Um, and we'll be going through models for most of them. The first is this one in call, uh, which, which I'm calling service population uh, interaction. And basically we're, we're using discrete event simulation here to capture services and workflows in services that are resource limited where an, an, an entity's progress down that is, is gated by availability of resources, but we're situating it within an agent-based context. Um, so we have agents, their lent faces upon the world, have networks, perhaps geography associated with them, but they flow into environments, um, facilities, um, organizational processes, you know, getting in line for vaccination um, uh, logically and then showing up at a vaccination center, which are gated by uh, discrete event simulation um, for this. So I'd like you to, to go and let's open a model together that, uh, that shows this pattern. So uh, I'm going to go and I'm going to secure such a model from the set uh, that I provided to you. Now, uh, on my machine, these are in a, um, a slightly different place, but you can go open up that, uh, that particular bundle uh, that I gave to you. And uh, you should see something called um, uh, multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects in lock-in, okay? Um, um, and uh, I'd like you to open open that model. Uh, so I have a propensity, which has been the subject of uh, some student mirth, uh, for uh, descriptive names at the expense of brevity. And um, uh, all I'll say is, uh, with respect to this model and its naming, one recognized the lion by his claw. Um, so uh, here we have this model. And uh, this model depicts a population of people um, who, um, who are characterized using a um, SEIS model, um, one that allows for reinfection uh, with nary a significant recovered period. Watch out folks, some STIs are like this. Uh, it's pretty nasty. You don't, you're gonna, you don't get a long protection from chlamydia. Um, uh, following infection and, and treatment. Um, now, uh, moreover, within the context of uh, this model, these individuals will be seeking care. And uh, the care-seeking attitudes and status of a given individual is characterized using a different state chart. As with agent-based modeling, we characterize these different, these different concerns using different state charts. They have the option of interacting surgically, but, but they're by and large orthogonal. 
no fuss, no muss, right? We, we divide it up into these different areas, each affording uh, clarity. But these individuals are not evolving um, as, as fragmented atomistic individuals. No, rather they are placed in homes here um, and, and they can secure care within clinics. And each of those clinics is characterized by a, a rather simple process um, by which people come in, um, they attempt to be, a, be a, they wait for a resource in the form of a healthcare worker. If they do not secure service in time, they balk or they leave without being seen. That's this upper transition um, and they depart. Uh, by contrast, if they are served in a timely fashion and there's a, uh, a timeout associated with this of 300, if they are served within five hours, they go on to treatment uh, and there can either be failure or success of that treatment according to a certain probability. Now that treatment, uh, if successful, sends a message to the agent which um, indicates in rather uh, stylized fashion that their malady has been cured, okay? Um, uh, cured in a medical sense, not in the sense of uh, tanning. Um, uh, so uh, I'm, unfortunately, my, my any logic suffers a indignity seen in, in, uh, in Linux, which renders it uh, hard to read here. Um, uh, I wouldn't mind others sending messages to any logic to remind them of uh, the need to fix this. Um, but uh, essentially they are cured if the treatment was successful. Um, so on this exit, if it's successful, they are viewed as cured and we indicate to them with a message, uh, their new status. Treatment failure confirms uh, or leads to no change in their, their health status. So that cured message will in fact drive them from this uh, infective and symptomatic state back to the susceptible state. So it's as if they've been treated with antibiotics for chlamydia or gonorrhea, um, for example, uh, and, and become susceptible again. They're not conferred permanent immunity, but they are uh, afraid of the, the malady. Okay, so um, one of the um, points of interest that come out of this is with a person being captured as being affiliated with a home, uh, we can, uh, if we run this model, um, we can see that there's a spread of infection that takes place in the population, okay? Um, and specifically, people start infective and uh, the infection will spread. Uh, within the context of, of uh, some of their homes, for example. Um, but uh, here they're, they're going and many of them are seeking treatment at this clinic. Now, if we go and expand in any logic um, to see this other pain here, um, and uh, it's worth going through the pain um, in this case, and you scroll down here, we can go down to the clinic. And what we'll see is the clinic is, is providing service to these individuals. Uh, it's healthcare workers are utilized, uh, however, nearly a third of the time. Uh, and if we go back to the, um, to the full context, we'll find that you know, the, the infection is barely, uh, barely staying under, under control here. Um, people are, are developing maladies at a significant level. And at some point, there's a transition of a most adverse sort, okay? Where suddenly the population um, reaches that tipping point where the clinic can't keep up. And the number of uh, infected people um, uh, rises uh, and the number of infections per person rises and uh, the population enters a state where they, um, they couldn't be fully characterized as being happy campers, okay? And uh, 
there's a high prevalence of infection that, that is retained. That's a lock-in effect. Once it happens, it's hard to get out of it. So, you know, I'm going to speed that up and we'll find that it, the exact timing of it is a little bit variable based on happenstance. Um, but once it happens, um, it's hard to get out. Uh, it's hard to escape from it. Remember, a lock-in effect is an effect that Avoiding it is a lot easier than trying to escape from it once, once it's occurred. So I'm going to add a clinic here. I'm going to add a second clinic, okay? And, and I can run this. And, and what you'll find is it lowers uh, the number who are, who are ill at any one time. Uh, that's good. Uh, but we still have this uh, distressing prevalence of illness in the population with two clinics. Two clinics just ain't enough to serve the, uh, the demands of the, uh, the, the, the health of the population. I just added a, a uh, oops, I thought I did, but I'm gonna add a third clinic here. Oh, come on, there we go, okay. Uh, third clinic further brings down the count, but once again, it, it remains inadequate to task. Uh, okay, I, I pressed that twice, it was a bit of a delay. Four clinics, still not enough. I transition now to five clinics in hopes that it will provide requisite, uh, requisite support. Nope, still not enough. Six clinics. And now six clinics uh, serving the population remains uh, too little to vanquish the infection. Uh, Let's, let's try seven clinics here. Okay, now we've seen um, another sizable transition. Uh, the, the number of uh, infections here is, the uh, number of people infected at any one time is, is smaller. The fraction of the population that is, um, that remains infected though is stagnating about 0.78. Okay, I'm gonna try eight clinics here, okay? Um, now, the infection is vanquished. Eight clinics, great. Um, uh, let's let's try now going, and I am going to instead of running this model at full tilt initially and seeing the infection spread, I'm going to artfully call up this pain. I'm going to step it forward with this so it goes to the very start of the model, and I'm going to add add at its inception another clinic here, okay? And now, uh, by virtue of having that other clinic, I'm going to run the model at full tilt. And the infection never gets established. It never has a chance to spread because two clinics are readily enough to keep up with it. So lock-in effects, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look a little bit deeper at how these things are captured. Uh, when an, a person seeking care uh, decides, decides to seek care, they will head to the nearest clinic. They'll get the nearest agent amongst clinics and then they will move to that very clinic, okay? And upon arrival, they will be brought under care by walking in to the clinic. They are walking themselves into the clinic they record the number of presentations that they've made, as it's called in the in, in, in industry, uh, the number of appearances they've made at this healthcare clinic, and they've secured entry to this walk-in and they proceed through this. Um, we've seen how the message takes place, but um, uh, upon their departure here, um, they, they are sent a message as well that says that they departed the clinic and that sends them back to their not seeking care state here. Okay, they've departed the clinic here and they go home, they head home. So uh, this is a hybrid model. Um, it depicts the ways in which service limitations, the ability for a clinic to keep up with, with, with uh, demand for patients shapes broad patterns in the population. And in other variants of this model, you know, we've examined, for example, uh, the ability to change the resources. So we can add healthcare resources uh, here. Um, 
to cl to particular clinics to allow them to be you know to uh, proceed more quickly maybe sometime in a more articulated model we'd add nurses versus beds versus physicians we change the shift schedule and all of that would capture this interaction um, this interaction between a broader population captured for their life course and in the particulars of service delivery discrete event simulation as i articulated last time has often a very defined focus on when a person's in a process when an individual's in a process when the entity is in a process and here we can play to that strength while still capturing the effects over the life course by placing them as agents into a broader population. So that's an example model, an exemplar model of how we can bring those two together. And indeed our next Tuesday, we'll see how this is written writ large for our COVID-19 modeling, for testing processes, for lab processes, for contact tracing processes. Um, we make use of this, this interaction um, to inform an understanding for Prof Lab of, of their, um, their service needs or to, to inform an understanding of how delays and contact tracing might affect the spread of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan's north. Um, okay, so, so now let's, let's take a look at this, this paradigm that I mentioned previously in which we have part of the model articulated in system dynamics in part as agents, where those agents, ladies and gentlemen, are lent to face upon the world at a certain point in their progression. Perhaps it's associated with risk factors, such as the depredations of aging. Perhaps it's um, associated with exposures or, or adverse companionship. Um, people are individuated at a certain point and become, um, become agents that that stride upon the world as individuals, not merely as numbers, as was in stock and flow num uh, models. Um, so uh, we'll open up a, a model for that. Um, and that model goes by rather uh, a name that I find rather evocative. Um, uh, but if so, it's, it's, it's probably because I, I named it that um, because I, I precisely found it so. And it's called the budding hybrid SD ABM model, okay? And the name actually harks back to a, to a, a joking reference, uh, social epidemiologist and Dean of, of School of Public Health in Boston University, Sandro Galea, uh, made at a, at a certain meeting um, uh, it, of which I was a member. Uh, okay, so in this case, we have, um, uh, we have a population characterized as uh, using stocks and flows and as befits um, their tradition system dynamics, those individuals are captured uh, or that stage is captured here. We have non-diabetics and we have people who develop diabetes and uh, development of diagnosis of diabetes occurs on this transition here. This flow represents um, development of diabetes. Okay, um, now at first glance, this one could be excused for, for thinking that this is a plain old system dynamics model. But if you look further, the very names betray, if not whisper, they shout of something deeper going on because this is diabetics to be created as agents. And there's this, um, um, this enigmatically uh, named create agent trigger that um, is an event set to go off here. And when does that go off? Well, it's when this stock is greater, has more than one person in it. And what happens when that stock enjoys the benefit of such largesse of, of having more than one person in it? Well, we loop through when this triggers, um, we loop through for each of the individuals, each of the whole individuals in there, we loop through and we add them to the population. Now, you could be excused for saying, what's this add population? Well, this is any logics way of adding people into an agent population, okay? So we're basically adding them as agents. And correspondingly, we are, we are uh, removing them forthwith from, from this stock. And in case you didn't, 
Uh, you could do it. You can subtract from stocks and assign to them. Um, and uh, what it lacks in beauty, it makes up for it <laughs> utility. Um, and uh, please don't quote that to my software engineering students. Um, uh, and then having so done, we reset this, uh, this uh, event to fire again. So this model, if you run it, uh, begins with agents overwhelmingly in this non-diabetic state. But as they become diabetic, they become these agents whose face upon the world um, is nothing if not stylized. It's, it's this kind of uh, these uh, circles which, which lack, uh, lack full aesthetics, but what can you expect and from any near background. And um, uh, these, these circles, each of them represents the fact that there's a member of the population here and unfortunately, the population is covered up by the very circles of which it it is composed. But if you if you scroll here, um, it actually hasn't tracked. But you can go through and you can you can see there's there's uh, many people within that population. Three or four at the time I happen to click there. Um, so here we have a stock and flow model where individuals are uh, are mostly represented. Most of the population is represented as stocks and flows. And obviously this could be as many stocks and flows as you want. But once they develop a, a certain, get to a certain point, they become agents. And that affords us um, economy of computation. Most of the population is just kept track of as numbers, as counts of people. It's very quick, um, very, very rapid to, uh, to simulate, requires very little computational few low computational resources um, and allows our agent-based population to focus on a focal population, a population of, of foremost interest. Um, it's um, it, by virtue of the fact that fast, we can iterate our learning quickly. Never forget, it, these sort of modeling tools are used in a human theater where learning takes place through people. And that learning um, benefits from quick cycles, which benefit from faster models. So it's it's not a, ma a small matter. And it's one of the reasons why we we seek these days to place many models on GPUs and FPGAs to, to accelerate them yet further. It's to accelerate our minds, ladies and gentlemen, our thinking. Um, so within this context, um, once those people become agents, they can be lent heterogeneity. Um, they can be lent networks, they can be lent nested contexts, they can be followed for the rest of their life, or in some models, we've had them actually, you know, uh, be reabsorbed into the hegemony of SD models once they've passed through a certain point. Maybe they're agents as long as they have active COVID symptoms. Some agents keep it for long COVID, which may last many, many, many months, believe me. Avoid COVID. It's nasty long COVID is, is really nasty stuff. And it may scar lungs, uh, heart, and other organs for life. Um, but as long as someone has symptoms, perhaps we keep them in this population. Otherwise, they could be absorbed back into the stock and flow population and disappear as agents and become counts of numbers. A very elegant approach and one that was central to our modeling strategy early on um, and particularly last summer with respect to capacity planning for our province. Um, Elegant puts our effort where it needs to be. The computational efforts are put into the, to the areas of foremost interest. We can capture that area with, with great richness while uh, still maintaining some basic understanding of the broader population. This sort of modeling um, uh, is very little practice because most people aren't aware of just how, how powerful this combination is. Let's take a look at another incredibly powerful, insightful um, uh, tool that, that is underutilized. It's one we've published uh, quite a bit on, particularly in the uh, uh, immunoepi area, the area that links together people's immune dynamics how the virus spreads within a body and, and multiplies and how the 
immune system clamps down in it and fights it and squeezes it out along different lines of the immune system, antibody, cell-mediated immunity with, with uh, uh, cyto, uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes and natural killer cells, et cetera. Um, here we have, um, uh, we have dynamics which goes on within a person that is characterized in the language, the, often the preferred language of articulating rich theory, which is system dynamics, stocks and flows, ordinary differential equations. And then those agents, we have agents who are placed in a context of networks, placed in a context of spatial geography, and they, have, they evolve by interaction with those other agents. It's by virtue of, of being um, a partner of another agent that they have risk of, of communicating a chlamydia, trachomatis to them, for example. Um, and by capturing this dynamics within a person, bacterial or viral, and capturing this uh, broader context, we can secure the best of both worlds. So um, in order to capture that, I'd like, I'd ask for you to open a model that's called CTL state variable use any logic seven. Um, sorry, we, we've gone through many iterations of these models for our boot camps that we offer worldwide and at U of S for worldwide participants. Um, as any logic progresses, we often have to go and quickly sort of fix up models for the next boot camp. Okay, so here we have uh, agents who at first glance have a singularly uh, stylized, um, if not stark representation of their, of their progression. Um, uh, the, the living and, and the dead. Um, uh, but if you scroll over, you'll find that in fact, the situation is more textured. We have within a given person, this is all in the context of a person, um, we have a, a variety of stocks, um, four, um, count them, no less. Um, and these are stocks associated with uninfected cells, you could think of it as cells of the epithelium, for example, the throat, uh, infected cells in that same area. Cells can be infected over time by the presence of free virions, these, these virus particles that circulate within the body, um, uh, distressing abandon at very high levels of, of infection. Um, we have uh, V indicating those free virions. Um, and variants are produced upon the lysis of cells that give rise to them. So these cells get infected and they start serving as factories for these variants. They undergo apoptosis or they, they die. And uh, actually it's more like lysis, they explode or what have you with these variants. And these variants run amok um, as free variants, V. Uh, and then we have cell mediated immunity, I believe specifically here, um, it captured with Z which basically reflects the immune system's response to this. It detects these and it starts ramping up, although at a slower speed. Um, and uh, the immune system then starts to kill off the infected cells uh, as well. And eventually it brings it under control through its multiplication, but it takes some time. So for example, let's run this uh, one called high viral threshold, okay? So within each person, oh, I, I should, have, should have mentioned, these people are placed in networks. Um, uh, it's, it's not really obvious here, but they are uh, placed in a population of agents here. Um, and uh, we do have networks defined, which if you were to look for main, uh, you would find uh, down in the space and network area are defined as a distance-based network, okay? Um, and we have some graphs down here in Maine concerning mean viral load of the population, um, uh, immune response, et cetera. And if you go run this with the high viral threshold, you'll see um, a uh, visualization that um, um, enjoys a, a certain uh, aesthetics um, to recommend it. Um, so in this case, what we basically see is a, um, is a dynamics associated with two things, one shown with color and the other with, with the radius of a cell. 
um, excuse me, the radius of, associated with this uh, depiction of a person. So people here, people are denoted with these, uh, if we had scrolled over, uh, they're denoted with these little circles, but the circles aren't always so little. Um, the circle width, and if we go up here, you could see it's rather nice in any logic, it's declaratively characterized. This model goes back way far. This is being uh, through many versions of any logic where how you captured interconnections uh, visually was, was different. Um, what you'll see is that uh, the color of this uh, is given by this thing called people color, which is a variable and where the radius is given by five times Z. Okay, so the radius of these, um, this flexing radius is keyed on, and you can see it oscillating here, is keyed on the, um, the level of, of, of uh, immune response or, or immune system strength right now. And the color, by contrast, um, is set by uh, this variable which is dictated in turn by uh, an aspect of their, their current viral load, okay? So uh, within each agent uh, here, we have a variable, boom, people color. And uh, this is uh, updated over time periodically um, to, oh, what a horrible name. Um, uh, but in any case, it should be done better from a software engineering standpoint. But uh, essentially, we update their people color in a most uh, imperative fashion that that positively grates on me. Um, so um, here, here, ladies and gentlemen, you see the dynamics, therefore, of immune system strength, uh, radius, uh, viral load level um, with uh, color uh, evolving for this set of people. And it's transmitted across these network connections. Uh, as a person becomes infected, they develop high viral load levels, that's the bright red, but their immune system expands its defenses in return. That's the, uh, the uh, radius. Um, it mounts a response that eventually kills off infected cells, brings down the viral load um, through uh, the dynamic uh, seen earlier through this uh, dynamic associated with the feedback, uh, negative feedback uh, involving the impact of the immune system on um, uh, on the, uh, the the number of infected cells. Over here, the immune system kills off infected cells through these cytotoxic T lymphocytes, these cells. And, and then that brings the immune system, uh, that brings the viral load level down. Hence it, it's waning here. And the immune system remembers it for a long time, just as your body will remember the effect of, will secure a certain amount of immunity from getting infected by COVID-19 that lasts months, but it doesn't last forever here. And it most certainly does not last forever for either vaccine induced immunity, maybe six month-ish according to a study today. Um, and uh, for, uh, for natural exposure, um, maybe six months to a year um, um, protection uh, against the same strain. Um, and so you have this immune response, which is retained, but it fades over time. And that sets the stage for reinfection within that same network. Now, um, this is a rather optimistic uh, depiction and some might find it interesting, for example, to consider um, the effects of possible death uh, if the viral load level goes too high. And indeed, that's a distressing feature of COVID-19 in young people, as well as older. Often in young people, it's the immune response, the so-called cytokine storm that can end up killing someone. It's the immune system's inflammatory response that, that um, overwhelmingly responds to this viral threat and can uh, overshoot in a way that actually harms health and can actually be lethal. For older individuals, it's often the viral load level just overwhelms the immune responses and, um, and sadly, uh, sadly ends up uh, ending their life. So um, here we have infection, but some of the individuals die from from infection. 
and in fact, in this model, by virtue of representing uh, the the uh, natural history of infection, not as a state chart, not as the stock and flow at an aggregate level, but at an individual level, we can capture individual responses such as strength of immune response C, for example, um, which uh, by which some individuals might better respond to the infection compared to others. So that was a, a bit of a, of a deep dive on a model. The point is, there's many cases where we have theory that's rich and articulated at an individual level and um, where we at the same time want to capture rich context, geography of, of spatial positioning within facilities of networks, one or more networks, um, capture nested context. Uh, maybe we want to capture an individual's progression through life as an individual, not as a number in some cross-sectional summary. Um, and we can do so and square that circle, ladies and gentlemen, by representing an individual's internal dynamics with this rich theory articulated with stocks and flows and have those individuals placed within networks which are, are agent-based. And interestingly, if you look back to some of the earliest contributions in system dynamics, work of Jay Forrester in the late 50s and early 60s at MIT, um, in my old home department there, um, one of the things he was exploring was having companies have internal dynamics represented by stocks and flows, but deal with each other and companies through networks of supply relationships, supply chains, for example, which is very, cues very much to the vision. Um, uh, and uh, that, that paradigm retains its freshness, its currency, its responsiveness, and its power to this very day. Um, so there's a lot of benefits here. We have continuous variable, you know, variable dynamics within a person. We can have these rich theory uh, driven methods. We could show this depiction to a virologist um, or you know, a, a person who, who deals with um, uh, you know, response uh, symptom wise. Um, such as my colleagues over in respirology with whom I cooperate carefully uh, or quite a lot. And, and one could discuss that theory with them and, and welcome their critiques, uh, inform it with data, uh, secure their feedback on the dynamics one sees at an individual level. It is declaratively specified by virtue of writing these out as system dynamics equations, others can look at it and uh, appreciate the structure in a way that would be difficult if it were Java code, um, as is the traditional um, uh, mode of describing uh, agent-based models, Java code or NetLogo code or C++ code or pick, ladies and gentlemen, your poison. Um, so uh, here we've used this approach in many different contexts, whether it's evolution of weight or uh, insulin and glucose dynamics, uh, whether it's aspects of uh, level of physical dependency on a, on a substance, um, such as in the context of opioid abuse, uh, buildup of tolerance um, for immunoepi on the area of, of flu and the area of chlamydia. Uh, and it's a very rich uh, approaches, and indeed we've used it for a pathogen um, and buildup of pathogen at certain um, places. Um, uh, so for example, and I won't go through this in as much detail because uh, time is of the essence, but um, another model I've given you um, uh, does provide uh, here this, um, uh, this depiction of uh, spread within the context of uh, uh, an environment that can be contaminated, this environment contamination hybrid. Uh, we won't have a chance to really explore this other than to, um, to, to run it. I'm gonna run this medium population at, at um, some, uh, some risk here um, of slowness. But here we have people in homes, um, uh, a, a single index individual begins um, 
begins infective, those people uh, can spread it um, in their homes to uh, their, their hostmates. Um, they, during the daytime, they go to work in, uh, in uh, workplaces, which are shown with this sort of factory iconography. Um, but in each of those environments, not only can they spread it person to person, but there's a buildup of pathogen. And the buildup of pathogen um, takes place using a stock and flow um, paradigm. So whether it's a workplace and we have a pathogen reservoir where people who are infective in the workplace can shed pathogen and over time pathogen through drying of surfaces and um, uh, ventilation of aerosols dies out or whether it's a, a home which is similarly characterized in a way that just begs for an abstraction to characterize both. Um, um, uh, we, we can capture this buildup of contamination in these environments. And people can get infected not only through exposure person to person, but also through environment, uh, environmental infection. Um, in fact, I think in this case, there's not even person to person, it's all through environment. But in general, you could have both, such as for COVID-19. Um, and so for each person, their current exposure level is calculated based on their environment at the time. And people bring it back home, workplace, home, workplace in a way that diffuses it across the population um, without explicitly representing networks uh, as such. And you can see pathogen levels, for example, climbing here. Um, obviously, um, if, if you're paying close attention, you could start to think about combining this with the discrete event simulation hybrid earlier, and you'd have a tripartite um, uh, hybrid that secures the trifecta of characterizing not just agent-based relationships and nested context and homes and so on, not just location, but it would also characterize dynamics within a given set of agents such as home and workplaces with pathogen reservoirs and care seeking behavior and treatment mediated in fact uh, treated uh, treatment mediated um, um, uh, recovery. So here we have a model that um, is a hybrid of system dynamics and um, uh, in agent based modeling, where once again we have dynamics within a context that's characterized with stocks and flows. Uh, another model um, that I did provide to you was, is one that um, uh, uses this in uh, patches. Um, uh, and that provides a way of, of basically characterizing geographical patches that, uh, that evolve according to system dynamics within a patch. But then there's... Um, there's a, a set of agents, each of which are patches that are interconnected locally to, to neighboring patches. And you can get spread of, of infection among those. Um, and there's actually a, a, a simpler model that does this that um, I, I really should have provided. But each patch here is characterized with birds and mosquitoes um, and indeed um, humans associated with it. And uh, those, uh, those equations were uh, put into place by um, students um, uh, some years back uh, in, to characterize the spread of West Nile virus. And so essentially we can have these patchworks that characterize risk in different areas. And indeed um, this very week, I was on a call with tick-borne infection modelers uh, of, with whom I'm contemplating a, a similar approach to characterize uh, tick-borne uh, infection spread uh, for things like uh, Lyme disease um, for different areas of Saskatchewan as well as uh, more broadly in Canada based on local topography, um, vegetation, um, uh, and uh, aspects of climate uh, within those regions. Um, okay. Uh, uh, another compelling pattern though, um, in responsive to the, to the limited time we have, is where agents drive, a population of agents here, drives evolution 
at an aggregate level within a system dynamics model. Um, this is rather flip from what we saw in earlier ones, right? Where we had um, within an agent, we had stocks and flows and it was agents at the upper level. Here we have system dynamics at the upper level. Um, maybe this is a population at different levels of risk. And we have a population maybe of, of companies. Maybe these are uh, companies promoting uh, uh, unhealthy foods, um, sugar sweetened beverages and, uh, and, uh, and uh, minimally nutritionally um, uh, substan minimally nutritional uh, products such as uh, Twinkies and host Hostess cupcakes. When I teach in this in Australia, we use um, Tim Tams and meat pies. Um, but uh, they they sell um, they sell product which affects the health of the population. Maybe these are competing tobacco companies, uh, which are promoting these days um, in uh, cigarettes as well as uh, other products like uh, cigarillos and, and cigars, but also things like uh, Juul and, and um, uh, e-cigarettes. But they affect the health of this upper level population. And you have these companies engaging in interactions and competition themselves, driving, uh, driving this upper level system dynamics model. Um, uh, finally, I'm going to uh, characterize uh, an approach where we have uh, system dynamics uh, driving agents. And we saw some of that um, earlier as a, as a kind of vignette, something that at, is at once a case of agents having internal dynamics um, that's characterized with stocks and flows, but also cases where stocks and flows are leading to the evolution of other agents, namely um, to the evolution of these person agents. The person agents within that environmental contamination model, uh, they didn't have stocks and flows within them, but their, their progression, their infection uh, was contingent upon environmental infection based on these stocks and flows externally. Um, so you could view it, uh, with a bit of apologies as kind of being an instance of where environmental dynamics affect agents. Uh, but it's also one where we have these environmental actors characterize themselves as agents um, and have internal stock and flow dynamics. But for that last model that we open, this, this West Nile model, um, um, which um, desperately needs some further um, uh, further evolution to realize its full potential with machine learning methods that have proven incredibly powerful in the COVID-19, pertussis, measles, uh, and, and TB and other contexts. This model, you could imagine, instead of humans being captured with stocks and flows, uh, as they are here, with different levels of infectivity, susceptibility, exposure, et cetera. Um, we could instead capture this so that humans are agents. And so we have these humans striding upon the world surrounded. Indeed, I think every one of you, without exception, knows what I mean here in Saskatchewan if we say sometimes surrounded by mosquitoes, right? Uh, in, the, in the right environment, um, um, surround is, is the right right word for it. Um, and uh, surrounded by mosquitoes um, in an environment with birds that exchange West Nile virus with these mosquitoes. Um, and maybe you'd have those characterized at the overall global level for a patch maybe, or for a, you know, some defined region, Saskatoon, uh, Regina. Um, and those overall dynamics of infected mosquitoes then infect these agents who are people and um, bring on uh, infection from West Nile and in some cases, serious West Nile symptoms. Our province is the hardest hit of any place in the Western hemisphere for West Nile infection. Um, a lethal disease, a potentially lethal disease with, um, um, with uh, some very nasty side effects such as acute flaccid paralysis, uh, encephalitis, 
swelling of the brain and, and, and potentially permanent neurological damage. Um, so uh, within this context, we have, um, uh, you know, agents who could be circulating, being exposed, and then um, uh, having all the benefits of agents associated with their geographic location, um, care seeking, uh, getting tested, et cetera. Um, uh, okay, so um, let's let's talk briefly about these. I've, I've tried to hit, you know, weave into my discussion some motivations, but I'd like to, um, uh, to do so a little bit more here. Um, so um, if we think about these hybrids, um, the first type, the DES hybrids, can, can really help us understand how these limitations I emphasize on service provision um, can affect the broader population. And it also affects things which traditionally models leave outside their scope of, of just services. They focus on just the encounter of the time when the patient's in the facility and they don't deal with things like as effectively re-presentation, people coming back um, because they didn't secure appropriate care or was inadequate at some level. Um, and uh, we can look at how interventions within the population affect service demand and how innovations on the service side like faster lab testing processes might offer benefits to lower the spread of COVID-19 by allowing people to know quicker if they're infected and to isolate faster, for example, um, or faster contact tracing uh, through uh, facilitated through apps might allow for people to, to be sequestered more quickly. Um, and you know, compared to pure ABM, by combining this, it's really much easier to capture service delivery resources, waiting and cues and, and uh, you know, the, the impact of uh, people's balking and so on. We can code that up with ABM, but it's not the right language. We're talking here, ladies and gentlemen, about taking advantage of a privilege we enjoy as computer scientists. The privilege, ladies and gentlemen, that is true to our field's uh, elevation of abstraction as a key tool. But this is not functional abstraction. It's not class-based abstraction that you learned about in 270. It's meta-linguistic abstraction. It's choosing the right language to use to articulate our solution to a problem. And in some cases, to characterize the problem itself. We as computer scientists build languages. Indeed, our very lab does for agent-based modeling as well as uh, other types of modeling. Um, by building the right language for the particular set of needs, we can often have a um, very effective tool that's provided to allow for uh, problem solving in that area, rather than force fitting everything to be a nail for our hammer and hammering screws in that are better, better, um, uh, better uh, screwed in with a Robertson screwdriver. Um, why not use each method on its own? Well, look, agent-based modeling is too coppersome to capture the resource dynamics. Discrete event modeling by itself, it really lacks the requisite flexibility and, and it's hard to characterize you know, key population health concerns like agent engine interactions, agent environment interactions, et cetera. Could it be done? Yeah, look, either of these is computationally universal. Just like we could do it with a Turing machine, could we do it with either one of these? Sure. Just like you could write it in assembly language or put it into Perl. Yeah, you could write the simulation there, but it's not the right tool for the job. This individuated one, um, we've, we've talked about it there um, uh, at, at some length. So I won't dwell on this too much, particularly the computational frugality and the, the capacity to focus our hard hitting computationally demanding areas the models on the populations of focal interest. Um, uh, and uh, we have the ease of representation and clarity for many stakeholders of representing the whole population in a, in a, in a way that's higher level, but still quite transparent and declaratively characterized with stocks and flows. By declaratively, I say we characterize what we want to describe and we don't get into all the details of exactly how it's instantiated, how it's, how it's implemented. Uh, why not each method alone? Well, look, 
with age-based modeling, it's going to be very computationally effect, um, expensive to capture this. We do it. And in fact, our model next week, you'll see ABM, hybrid ABM for the entire province of Saskatchewan. Every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, every one of you is on there. But don't worry, we don't have your names. Um, but but you know you're some some proxy representation for people of all different ages and all different locations throughout every community are captured um, according to demographics. We can do that, but you know it's it's fairly high burden, and uh, you got to run it again and again in an agent based way, um, and uh, it's going to slow down learning some. Uh, it's slower to build. Um, uh, it requires more articulation and. Frankly, system dynamics can be done by people without really programming background. Whereas the current state of the art is you really need, need some computational background, some programming experience to take advantage of agent-based modeling. Um, and it's less, less widely available as a, as a skill set. Um, if any of you are interested in modeling as a career, come talk with me. There's a lot of demand right now, uh, more so than any time in my lifetime. Um, Aggregate system dynamics modeling um, could be used here, but you know it, it doesn't capture the requisite detail often we want about a person's history. Um, their particular story is not captured in a stock and flow model. We're not capturing how many times a given individual has been infected. We can't do it. It just gives a depiction how many people are here at this time, how many at that same time, how many people are here. We don't know if it's the same person both times. How many times have people gone around? We, we, don't, have, we don't have ways of, of probing people's history at a biographical level, um, you know, at a level of, of following their particular trajectory. Um, and in general, capturing interagent interactions, norms, networks, spatial context is really, really poor. Um, and we can't really scale to capture the heterogeneity. System dynamics, aggregate models scale terribly with heterogeneity. We, we want to capture male versus female, double the model size, double the model running time, double the number of stocks, double the number of, of most of the flows, et cetera. Um, system dynamics uh, driven agent-based modeling, nice theory within a person to drive them in a continuous fashion for those areas of their dynamics, which are continuous state charts, events, variables for other areas. But system dynamics models for those theory-driven um, uh, components. Um, by virtue of having agents, you have this ability to, to capture the spatial context, their network context, one or more networks. And you can mix you know, this discrete and continuous state charts and discrete events and, and events uh, with, with continuous uh, dynamics. Um, it's, it's actually quite, uh, quite beautiful. Why not each alone? Why not just pure system dynamics? Well, you'll find um, the SD tragics, as as a, a colleague of mine calls them, who uh, who you know system dynamics only, system dynamics now, system dynamics forever was where their concept of system dynamics is rather impoverished. It's stocks and flows model. I see a much broader notion of system dynamics that is inclusive of agent based modeling, but that's another another uh, for another day. Um, system dynamics really does not have good support for, you know, dynamic populations. You can array a model, subscript it by person, but it's pretty thin pickings. And I speak from the authenticity of much experience in both agent-based modeling and this. And I know a pale cipher when I see it. Um, it has poor ability to express discrete dynamics. It's unnatural and awkward representation of interagent characterizations. And it really has poor encapsulation, and, you know, for example, of nested contexts, networks, or what, what have you. Um, uh, the geography. Agent-based modeling is, you know, it, it's not a great language for describing continuous dynamics that's theory-based. Uh, maybe in 20 years, we're working at it, we're working at it, but it still has this lack of concision and description, poor transparency to stakeholders, writing a bunch of Java code is just, not going to be transparent for a lot of folks. And, um, you know, state charts get you uh, a long distance, but they don't get you to the continuous dynamics. Um, and there's a lot of jiggery pokery that goes on there to make it sing. Um, these two 
belong together. This is a marriage made in heaven, and we are working to to realize it more fully. Why not for for this one? Why not uh, each alone? Well, look, system dynamics has has really um, poor characterization of of rich dynamics associated with company interaction or or agent interaction, supply networks, etc. Um, you can characterize a whole lot here geographically, network-wise, history-wise, as we've said. Agent-based modeling, um, to characterize all of this with agent-based modeling, well, it's a matter of computational burden. GPUs, FPGAs go long distance. Um, smart compiler analysis, good languages that can optimize out a lot of overhead. Good stuff, widespread parallelization, but the field's not there yet. I'm trying to drag them, but it's hard work. Um, uh, and there's, uh, there's, you know, rather poor support here for this uh, continuous dynamics. Finally, aggregate system dynamics drives the agent-based population. Um, similar set of, of trade-offs. There's, um, uh, you know, yes, we could capture every mosquito in Saskatchewan as an agent and every bird in Saskatchewan as an agent. Ain't gonna fly, ain't gonna fly. Throw me all the GPUs you want, I ain't gonna fly. Um, uh, when those mosquitoes take wing, they are numerous uh, beyond counting uh, in certain regions. And it doesn't make sense to stuff it all into, age, uh, into system dynamics modeling to represent uh, people as, as with system dynamics only is not capturing uh, the dignity of their history, their trajectories, their multi-time exposures, their care seeking, et cetera their heterogeneity, their geographic specificity. This too is uh, a marriage made in heaven with frameworks can support it. And any logic can weave these all together. So hybrid system science methods, as you'll see writ large next week with our COVID-19 work, offer diverse benefits that exceed those of any one method. Truly there's a, a hole here that's bigger than the sum of its parts. Um, a key benefit is this capacity to evolve them out of boundary between different methods as learning takes place. Because learning, because modeling is a learning endeavor. Models are learning prostheses. Um, and particular subsets of system science methodologies um, can be configured in ways to, to speak to different areas of your research or problem context. And really, this is about selecting your modeling methods according to the principles of metalinguistic abstraction. You choose your languages, you choose your frameworks, your formalisms, according to your needs for different areas of the model, not just throwing all your eggs in one basket. That sounds that sounds messy, uh, but putting all your eggs in one basket of one method. Um, and uh, you know, to really understand the trade-offs here, to understand the benefits speak to those who have done it in spades. There's very few of us, but once you've done it in spades, you're never going back. So hybrid, hybrid dynamic modeling, absolutely compelling motivations, compelling exemplars for why we apply it. And with those comments, I will uh, stop this lecture. <laughs>